go ahead and let's uh, bow forward in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. Thank you, O oh God, that you've allowed us to wake up this morning, O oh God, and then you've kept us this day. You've shielded us, O oh God, from all hurt, harm, and danger, O oh God, and shielded those we call hurt, harm, and danger to you. Now, O oh God, as we come together as a community, God, first of all, we want to thank you, O oh God, for our brothers and sisters. God, we want to thank you, O oh God, for giving us one more day, O oh God, and we want to thank you, O oh God, for this time in history. God, we ask that this time would be productive, O oh God. We pray, O oh God, that you would be with us. God, I pray that everything that is said and that is done in this house, oh God, that it will be pleasing in your sight. God, I pray that you would strengthen us as a community, oh God, that you would strengthen us, oh God, as individuals, oh God, that you would strengthen us, oh God, uh, as Elizabeth Town and as Bladen County, oh God, bring us closer together, oh God, that you might be glorified, that your people might be edified, and that Satan will be terrified. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Again, welcome to our town hall tonight. This is a, this a follow-up. We had a town hall about two weeks ago. And this is a follow-up, and we're going to have some uh, dialogue. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, prejudice in our country, racism in our country, and how to improve the relationship uh, with law enforcement. Amen, somebody. Amen. So uh, we're going to ask uh, that the panel, we do have our panel, grab one more chair here. Uh, I'm going to ask the panel if you would start from this end, if you would just uh, give us a brief introduction what your name is, what was your name, and uh, where do you work? I'm Larry Guy. I'm the Chief Deputy for the Blake County Sheriff's Office. My name is Daniel Goodwin. I was born and raised in Columbus County. My dad was born in Little Town, retired from the mill. Uh, I graduated from Hall of Honor, spent time in the U.S. Army and Chapter PD, and I've been with the Highway Patrol now for uh, going on 24 years. I uh, worked over here in Blake County from 1996 to 99. And my name is Kia Jessup. I am from White Oak, North Carolina. Graduate, uh, first graduating class of West Bladen High School. I am currently the pastor at Miller's Chapel and Design Church in Garland, North Carolina. Uh, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, Robert Taylor, Superintendent of Bladen County Schools, uh, native of Mississippi. I've been blessed to be your school superintendent for the past five years, now starting in my sixth year. I've been in North Carolina since 1992. Evening, folks. My name is Quentin McGee. I'm the Chief Assistant District Attorney here in Bladen County. I've been serving the 13th District uh, for about four years now. Uh, prior to that, I was in private practice as a defense attorney, so I've seen it from both sides of the law. I'm very proud to be serving here in Blake County. Good evening, my name is Jim McMurray. I'm sure Sheriff of Blake County. I've been living here since 1988. My entire family's here, and I am proud to be Sheriff of Blake County. I am very happy to get to find out where my title is. I've been pastor of the church, Unique Baptist Church, Blake County Chapel, Juvenile Crown Chairman. Uh, president of the Blade Ministerial Association. I got a few other titles that I'm called by. I'm going to change that. Uh, Martin Dean Christa. God bless you, and I'm glad to be here and serve on this panel. I'm Reverend Dr. Louis Bork, I'm the pastor of the Baldwin Branch Missionary Baptist Church here in this time. I'm a native of Clinton, North Carolina. I've been serving the Baldwin Branch. Completed my fourth year, really my fifth year, and I enjoy serving the citizens of this community. Amen. Can we give our panel a hand this evening? <laughs> Again, our goal, we want to um, we want to begin the conversation. I don't believe that we will be able to, ta to tackle everything, but we do want to begin the conversation. Our nation is going through so much right now, there's so much attention in our communities, so we want to begin the conversation. And we want to keep the conversation going at several churches, several locations, um, to bring a unified Lady County community and also a visit to our community. All right. Just a few, um, do a few checks and balances uh, for our panel discussions tonight. Uh, first of all, the question will be asked. Uh, we had several people to email questions in. I think uh, Charlotte for her vision, email the questions in, a few people have email questions in. Panel member, 
will have up to five, excuse me, five to seven minutes to respond to the question. Following the panel's response, there will be about seven minutes for discussion. And so again, a question will be asked. Some are geared towards a clergy. Some are geared towards law enforcement. But the question will be asked. There are some that are open-ended, and anyone uh, can take it on. And so, um, you know, again, and then there will be uh, seven minutes for discussion between the panel and the audience. Our, folk, our first goal here is to listen. Uh, first goal here is to listen. Let me say it one more time. First goal here is to listen. Uh, audience to panel, panel to audience. Uh, not for anybody to become defensive, not for anybody uh, to, you know, to get, you know, tense or anything, but we want to have discussion. And I've said to several in our community that big picture thinking, we want to get to a unified community. But if we're honest about it, there's some ugly things going on within our nation and our community. And so we have to have tough conversation to get to the utopia that we all want to be in. Um, again, following the panel's response, there will be no attacking of the panelists. Uh, T.D. Jakes says in his book, Let It Go, we have to learn to attack the problem, not people. Amen. Learn to attack the problem, not people. People, we, we are suggesting tonight uh, that racism and prejudice is a problem in our nation. These are two major things going on in our nation. We are not attacking anybody, but we want to attack the problem and attack it together. Our goal here again is to have some of the difficult uh, conversation to produce long-term healing. We may find some solutions tonight, but I believe that with more conversation, combined with actions, it will come together and bring about transformation. The conversation again should not stop here, but it should take place in our communities as well. And let's establish something right off the bat, that not every law, en law enforcement officer is crooked, racist, or prejudiced. Every black person isn't a criminal or thug. Every white person isn't racist. But we have to deal with the issues in our nation and in our community. Amen, somebody? Amen. Every law enforcement agent is not crooked. They're not prejudiced. They're not racist. Not every black person is a criminal or a thug. Every white person is not racist. Uh, but we have to deal with the issues. Again, we are attacking issues, not people. All right? Does every, everybody understand the rules? Uh, we're going to govern ourselves accordingly. All right, uh, let us open. Uh, race relations in our country, uh, race relations in our country have been questionable at best. Uh, beginning with some of our founding documents written in a time when African Americans were considered to be three-fifths three of a person, to the forceful removal of natives from their homes, to the institution of slavery, to the institution of lynching, Jim, Jim Crow laws. When we are honest in our conversations, some races, some sexes, some ethnicities have been afforded rights that others have had to struggle or protest for. Certain ideologies are passed down generations on all sides of the table, which produce unnecessary hatred and prejudice when infants can hold hands and hug, whether their parents see them or not, and then become enemies later on in life, there's a problem in our nation. We can't afford to run from this problem any longer. We can't continue to sweep it under the rug. In order to produce change, these problems must be confronted. When you mix in what the media has to say, who will show more law enforcement brutality than law enforcement positively socializing in their community, or the media who will showcase more of the militant Black Lives Matter movement members than those who are simply saying that hashtag Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that no one else matters, but it simply means that we live in a society that it seems like our lives are less than uh, are less than a value, less value. Uh, Black Lives Matter is not only Lives Matter, or the media who will only show, show one side of the story. It creates more chaos in our nation. What am I saying to us tonight? We have the unique opportunity to not only confront, 
but help eradicate what plagues our nation and potentially our community. But it will take more again than one conversation. It will take us both addressing our own communities and continuing the conversation with each other to bring healing. I'll leave you with this question and then we're going to go on to our discussion questions tonight. Do we want our children or our grandchildren to either grow up or to, or to continue to grow up in a world or in a nation where they have to look over their shoulder every time they go outside, every time they go to the store, every time they hang with their friends? I don't desire any of my daughters to go through that struggle. I don't desire for my children to have to worry about their lives just walking out. And I believe that I have some others in this sanctuary tonight with the same idea. Amen, somebody. Uh, I don't, again, I don't desire for my daughters to live in a world like that. And I'm going to do everything in my power to address the issues at the root in order to bring about positive transformation. And if I can leave you with this, it takes all of us to make God's image. It takes all of us to make God's image. It takes all of us. Jesus did not die for ethnicity or race, but the scripture tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his own son. We are not attacking people, we are attacking problems. And with that being said, we're gonna open up our discussion uh, for tonight, our town home. Our first uh, question is geared towards law enforcement says, to ensure everyone's safety, what is the proper protocol for a driver when being pulled over if his wallet is in his pocket, her wallet is in her purse, or the necessary documents are in the glove box or under the armrest? And then a follow-up question, is each officer supposed to follow the same protocol? Law enforcement, anyone? I'll take that question since our primary job as North Carolina Highway Patrol is to ensure the motor public in the state has a safe and efficient transportation and everybody gets where they're supposed to be going safe. Uh, I'll try to address each part of those questions and I'll tell you, in my, this is my 30 years, I'm getting ready to retire and I've always run under the same philosophy and the guys that work for me and the ladies that work for me today, I tell them like this. The people you stop every day are 99.999% of those people are every day hard working, just like you and me and our families. They treat them like it's one of your family members. How would you want your family member treated if you got stopped on the side of the road or your mom got stopped, your sister, whoever it might be? But the answer to the question in short, if you get stopped by a law enforcement officer, daytime or nighttime, uh, if it's nighttime and you can turn the interior light on and turn the interior light on and get your hands on the steering wheel, uh, the officers are trained for safety purposes. They're trained as they approach that vehicle to look for your hands. If they can't see your hands, that you might hear them ask you to put your hands on the steering wheel. That's, it's not anything derogatory or negative. It doesn't matter who it is, where they come from, it's all about officer safety and they're, they're, they're taught to look at and make sure they can see your hand because the hands could be holding something that could potentially harm an officer. So, you know, even me as a law enforcement officer, I carry my sidearm with me when I'm off. If I get was to get stopped, I would leave my hands on the steering wheel. I'll answer the question from my own aspect uh, because, quite frankly, most of the time I carry it. Uh, if an officer come up, I'd say, sir, I have a firearm. Uh, I might tell him I'm a law enforcement officer, obviously, but you might be a carry concealed permit or just a, a citizen with a firearm. If the firearm's laying on the seat beside of me, please tell me exactly what you want me to do before I take my hands off the steering wheel because I don't want any misunderstandings. Uh, they might ask you to pick up the firearm with two fingers and hand it to them. If you have a carry concealed permit and there's nothing unusual, then we allow that firearm to remain with the vehicle because that person's been checked by the sheriff in the county to carry that firearm. Uh, if you need to reach in your pocket for your driver's license and offer, ask you for your driver's license, my recommendation would be, depending on which side, or if it's your purse, uh, if it's a lady and it's a purse, you can grab the purse and set it in your lap and leave one hand on the steering wheel. 
reach in to pull your wallet out. Once you get your wallet out, obviously you would need both hands to try to find your driver's license uh, or your purse. Uh, for a gentleman that carries a wallet in their back pocket or if it's in between the seat, I would leave one hand on the steering wheel and say, look, it's, it's, it's between my seat or it's in my console. I've got to open my console to get my wallet out. Is that okay? The console is right here. I would elaborate to that officer everything that I was going to do so that he didn't perceive anything that I knew to be a threat. Now, it goes back to training, y'all, and, and we have some of the best training that you can get on the North Carolina Highway Patrol. Uh, I know Sheriff McVicker here has implemented a strong training program for the deputy sheriffs in Bladen County. It's absolutely, they got training going on all the time. Uh, matter of fact, the Highway Patrol has got to participate in some of the sheriff's training. Uh, those guys are trained, we have to be safe, but we also have to know that we're dealing with, with the preacher. The preacher's son, my wife, maybe my grandmother. Just as long as you do what you're supposed to, uh, I think that might cover the first question. And what was the second part of that? I mean, you kind of, kind of God, I did it all? Okay. Thank you. Do we, do we have any uh, follow-up questions from the audience? Uh, the first question uh, was, if my, if my wallet, if my registration and my ID is not on my dash, if I have my wallet, I drive with my wallet in my pocket, or I have my ID in my purse or something, uh, what steps need to be taken uh, to ensure everybody's safe if I get pulled over? Uh, do we want to have any follow-up? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I want to ask you so, so what you were saying. The very first thing that I should do as a motor of being stopped by any type of law enforcement is to turn on the light inside the cab or inside the vehicle, place my hands on the steering wheel where they can be seen, and remain there until the officer approaches the car. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A little bit of follow up, very briefly. Back in the old days of the highway patrol, we initially, the first thing we'd done if we stopped you for speeding was got you out of the car and had to come sit with us and we sit there in the car and talk while we wrote a ticket. Well, that's proved to be an unsafe practice in today's society. We don't want people to get out of the car. As I ended my time on the road before I became a supervisor, I would say, I'm going to go back to my car, I'm going to issue you a citation for speeding. Please remain seated in your vehicle. And do not get out for any reason. I will be right back with you as soon as possible. If, then if somebody got out of that car while I was writing a ticket, a red flag flew up for me that something was wrong. That they didn't do what I asked them to do. And, and whether you agree with it or not, we're, we try to be professional, but nobody likes getting a ticket. And we have lawfully detained that person on the side of the road. So while you're lawfully detained, whether you're the driver or the passenger in the vehicle, you must follow our directions as we proceed through that traffic stop. Because we're probably only going to spend five or ten minutes with you. And if you think you weren't speeding, it's not the side of the road to try the case. That's the reason we have the courts and the jurors and the judges and the lawyers. And, you know, I try to explain to people and we have training and our radars are calibrated according to state law and everybody goes to certification. But I never try to try a case with somebody. If you feel like you weren't speeding, then I would say, I understand that. But I did clock your radar. And uh, if you'll go to court, then we'll discuss it. But anyway, yes, sir. My name is Sherman Lewis. Is Can everyone hear? Yes, sir. As a, as a former educator and also a driver's ed teacher. My comment to all of you all, how do we disseminate this information to our youth? But that seems to be a problem. Now as a driver's ed teacher, what you say is what I taught, but I don't think that's being taught all over North Carolina. So how do we do that? That needs to be a priority. So that's my comment. How do we go about getting this information out? We can't depend on home. Behind the state 
take pride in that they acknowledge the fact that they're realizing the control of pollution behind them, that the individual cut the interior light on and continue to travel to a well-lit area, is that still a safe practice? Very good question. This happens quite often, uh, especially for somebody who's in the middle of nowhere, uh, regardless of the age and, and sometimes regardless of the sex. Uh, they cut the flashers on and maybe slow down just a little bit to let the speed limit. And the officers will call in and you can hear them on the radio call communications. They'll say, I'm behind a car and it's not stopping, but they're not running and you cut the flashers on. And most of the guys know today's society that they're probably trying to drive to a lighted area. Uh, and so once they get to the next gas station or, or someplace, now sometimes you're not afforded that great opportunity in the rural counties that we live in. However, you could drive to someone's house where there was lights on. Uh, now, even in the rural parts north of the river and out east and west, you still have homes in a large percentage. So yes, if you'll just slow down and cut your flashes off. Uh, and, and do anything evasive, just you know, just get to the next house. But yes, sir, that, that's a good question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my name is Mary McMillan. Uh, I'm from I've had a lot of money in with different officers, state patrols too. Now, I was told uh, by the office from Ronald that when a cop or uh, even state patrol would stop you, <coughs> first asked them what was the reason they stopped you for. Now, I know that the majority of the time you stop is based on where you dress. I traveled 12 years from the post office he said. And before I reach the middle of the town, at least I can stop three or four times because it was the way I was dressed. I always wore a cap. And once some, some of the officers stopped me and they saw that I was a lady, they would say, oh, we try, uh, try to make sure you get home safe. Now, if I'm being stopped three or four times a week <coughs> by different cops, and I also did the state patrol, which I had been complaining about a few months during the night. Now, the officer in Wally, North Carolina, told me a cop, he was state patrol to stop me. The first <coughs> officer would say, Sir, why did you stop me? Is that correct? We carry a certain dialogue. We're trained verbal judo. One of those is, Hi, I'm sorry to hear we're on the highway patrol. I stopped you for speaking, Sammy, at 55. Can I see your driver's license and registration, please? And then we usually follow up with a question. Is there any reason why you were speaking? Because some people have reasons why they're doing stuff. Some people don't. Uh, so at some point in that conversation, you definitely, they should definitely tell you why they stopped you. Uh, that's, that's their job to do that. Uh, I kind of missed that in the beginning. I supervise both Clayton and Columbus counties now. And my former first sergeant is the sheriff. And another former first sergeant is the chief of Elizabeth Town, who covered both of these counties. If you run into a situation with North Carolina Highway Patrol and there's some question about the stop, that, and it really doesn't matter, if you've got a question, call us at the local Waffle office, our main office for Little Town and Blade, or any local office. You might not be in Blade in Columbus County. Call the local first office. Just about all of our highway patrolmen in an hour, they're following up with another batch of uh, in car cameras. All of our cars are equipped with some of the most high-tech in-car cameras uh, that I've ever seen since I've been on. It used to be an old VCR tape when first started. Now they're all digital, ma'am. The audio's there, the video's there, and when they pull in at the office, it automatically grabs that information off their computer in the car and downloads it to a mainframe. So if you had a stop, uh, there was a house bill recently passed, and there was some question, you or your representative, uh, attorney, or if you had some questions, uh, then you could come in and we would review that section of the tape only, nothing else, and, we, and we'd be able to see, you know, if there was something there. But we do monitor those tapes uh, quite frequently. I sit down, I might watch uh, one, one trooper's tape eight hours at a time. We're required to do that. I'll sit at the office while I'm doing paperwork and I'll turn it on and watch the videos. But, ma'am, I can't answer to what might have happened with somebody else but other than tell you what we're supposed to do. We'll have to stop right there. If we have some time at the end, if you want, if you have some more questions, uh, please feel free to write your questions down. Please feel free at the end. All right, our second question says, uh, 
based on media, it appears as though every law enforcement officer has either had paid leave or, and or the charges have been dropped when it comes to police brutality. First of all, uh, and this again for law enforcement, is police brutality a norm within Bladen County? And then a second question specifically for our sheriff, how would you handle the situation if one of your officers used extreme force and or killed a citizen? In regards to the first part of the question, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the process. Um, we've had a lot of officer-involved shootings around the country, uh, as we all know. Uh, there's a process that, that has to be followed. Um, depending on the agency, that determines whether someone's going to be at paid leave or, or what uh, is going to happen with that officer. In this jurisdiction, speaking for what we've had here in the 13th District, we've had at least five officer-involved shootings in the past few years. Uh, when that occurs, our policy is to have an outside agency, typically the State Bureau of Investigation, to come in and investigate the case. The reason for that is you need an objective body to come in and take a look and see if there's been officer misconduct or if it's a good shoot. And that's important because if it is a good shoot, and for instance, if the Sheriff's Office is involved in officer involved shooting and the Sheriff's Office investigates it, and the sheriff's office determines it was a good shoot. Well, members of the community might say, well, it was the sheriff's office, investigating the sheriff's office. Of course they say it's a good shoot, right? So there's some, there's some room for some misconception. But if you have an independent agency such as the SBI to come in that doesn't know the officers involved, that doesn't work with the officers involved, and can come in and say, hey, this is a good shoot, or it's a bad shoot, because in this jurisdiction we've had both. There's a process that has to be followed. And in the course of this investigation, of course, it takes time. And in some instances, that's why you see officers who are going through the process and hasn't been determined if they've committed a crime or not that are on paper. And in some instances, officers have been charged. In some instances, they've been cleared. Uh, and in different scenarios around the country, some situations such as Ferguson, you had officers investigating their cohort. Right? In other in situations, such as what you have here, you have an independent agency. So that's really what you strive for. And that's what you have here in the 13th District. It's transparency in the process uh, and, and an openness to that. Uh, our courtrooms are open. You're welcome to come in there daily and see what's going on. That's in your district courts and your superior courts. And so a lot of times people don't know what the process is. And I'm sure there are going to be questions about the process. We're glad to answer questions. Uh, about that than anyone may have. As far as the, the second part of um, the question, I'll endeavor to share. Anytime we have any kind of complaint on excessive force, uh, we confer with the district attorney's office, the elected official, and Clint McGee. No, we go by him and I don't have a conference about something that's going on. When I came in office 19 months ago, there was no call procedure for the Blake County Sheriff's Office. Within four months, with a lot of work from a lot of people, we do have a problem in procedure in place. At session four, we don't tolerate it. Uh, we have an internal affairs section that investigates it. If we see something lawful has been done by my office, we contact the district attorney's office. Any shooting situation we have, the first thing we do, you, when I leave my residence, is I'm, I'm on the telephone with John Day or anything. And that you, you literally have seen when I get there. Or so we don't investigate any shooting. <laughs> We're not excessive for to have to plan on that, but we have very, very few. But if it looks like there's something to it and the law that the law has been working, we got that district attorney and they may have the opportunity to investigate. Do we have any questions from our audience? Yes.
some type of determination at that point that something ain't right when you read those reports. And that's a very good comment or question. And whoever's involved in the situation, they all write statements. That there's 10 offers that you mentioned, we have 10 statements from one of these offers. And the supervisors that are ready to see uh, of his finding. And we get everything together, we have a, a, uh, a group that goes over. If we think it should go to the district attorney's office, or we take this very action, that's what we do. I'll answer your question. Uh, my question was, I think also what creates a sense of distrust is that we find um, there are certain great cops, and I would say the majority of police officers are good. Um, and you just may have a small percentage that don't do what they're supposed to do. Within the force, whether they be on the police um, department or sheriff's department, is there any type of protocol in which another officer who sees a fellow officer that's doing something um, outside of protocol, using excessive force, can he or she have some type of protocol that they can follow so that they can, um, there be some type of reprimand within the force um, that you all take take part of. Because a lot of times it seems as though, um, from what we're also seeing within forces, where police officers will go to their superior officer and say, hey, I have a partner, I have somebody that I'm working with that's not following protocol, but they're penalized because they spoke out or they can they're considered breaking ranks or breaking the unspoken brotherhood that you don't go against your folk. Um, so are there any type of um, repercussions for those who break protocol? And is there any protection for those who do step out and speak out against the fellow officer? And that's a great question, it really is. I can tell you that, I'm sure, the Blake County Sheriff's Office, we will not tolerate any brutality or any violation of the policy. And we've had officers come to their sergeants or their immediate supervisor and report of a death. And we've taken action on that. And we do protect our people. People in my office know if they get a complaint to be investigated. And there's no retaliation. You know, this is something I've heard all my 43 years of being law enforcement. I would have complained on the officer, but I was scared to would retaliate. I give you my word, and I can speak to the highway patrol, and I know this man right here with the police force. With the Blaine County Sheriff's Office, there will be no retaliation. And you just take my word for that. You, you'll have to trust me on that. No. Uh, any other follow-up uh, question or uh, discussion? Yes. Um, I had a problem with officers following me. This has been a problem for me for years. I've been mean, doing nothing, driving down the road. I get followed five or ten miles. I make it all out of time. Why is that? Why do they have to follow me? If they see I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be right, why don't they go do something that means a little bit more, to make a little more difference in the county? Well, ma'am, I can't speak to your individual uh, case, but um, as the district attorney, we are an advocates for the people. Right? We ensure uh, protection for the rights of victims, uh, as well as members of the community at law. Uh, what I will tell you uh, is that if you feel that uh, you are being unjustly followed or targeted uh, for, for some reason, document uh, the sheriff, uh, the chiefs of police uh, here within the county. Uh, we talk about these issues, they keep laws of, of those things, you can feel free to file a complaint. Uh, and that will help to build a record to establish and support uh, what you're talking about. Um, I would encourage you to do that, to document it. And once it's documented, uh, it can be shared with the district attorney's office. Uh, we can uh, further investigate that uh, because we're here to protect citizens as well. If that's something that, that's happening to you, uh, you should document it and, and make it help to make it known. We have about three more minutes. Uh, any, any follow up, any other questions? Uh, yes. Jerk begins with Singletary United Methodist Church. I am a youth leading church and I wanted to just what the gentleman said here. They are rotten apples in anything you do. I don't care if it's fire, law, whatever. There are some rotten apples that's a given. 
And not to pick on this we got back up there, but one of the things you can do to teach your children is self-respect. Now, granted, there are some right numbers, no matter how nice you are or how respectful you are, they're gonna do what they're gonna do regardless. But for the rest of the group and for themselves, if you teach them to respect themselves, they're gonna respect others. You cannot respect others if you don't self have self-respect first. That's number one. Number two, I was in New Orleans, and I was in civil care, I was not civil care, but legal care. I got stopped speeding, I was doing five miles over the limit. I threw my hands out the window, and I told the officer as he was approaching the car that I have a weapon in the car, a legal carry. The first thing he does, he gets in position, and he has me, orders me out of the car on my knees. He walks up and puts the gun to his weapon to my head. His partner comes in just a bit when he gets it out. Yeah, I'm we're in this position about five, ten minutes before he actually lets me up. Long story short, they ran the record and everything comes back. I get a speeding ticket and let me on my way. I've been in here in Blaine County now for 23, 20 years. Never had an issue with any agency. Be it police, fire company, police, sheriff, um, labor police, garden police when it was open. Never had an issue with any law enforcement agency in Blake, in Blake County, and I commend you guys on that. Um, as far as the fairness, I've been, my, my ex-wife and I, we had a worthless check come back, and we, both of us had a warrant for us, we were we was arrested for it, but the officer was arrested, he was polite, and we both respect for each other, for, for each other. I have all the respect for him in the world, nothing compared to what happened in New Orleans, and I just, I mean, I just want to Give you guys a big up, big up to that. I appreciate that. Okay, we have about uh, 40 more seconds. Any, any, any. All right, uh, we'll move, move on. Um, and if, if we have some time, we'll come back. If we have some follow up questions, uh, question for our pastors How do you address those in your congregations who you believe may be racist or prejudiced? Excuse me, do you address? If so, how? If not, why not? My name is Larry Hayes, Pastor Good News Baptist Church. Also, I'm proud to say tonight that I'm president of the Blake Ministerial Association. I would ask the pastor to attend that, please stand. As you see, there is a race difference there. And I believe that I can say with honesty that these that have stood up and myself preach the gospel. We believe that if we're not part of the solution, then we have become part of the problem. And if we don't work ourselves together, and if it doesn't, if the gentleman asked while well, I do, how are we going to tell our children, take them to church? <laughs> Quit letting grandma and grandpa take them to church. Take them to a church that the preacher's not ashamed to preach the gospel. And quit preaching three point sermons. Preach Jesus Christ, ten crucified, and the Amen. We can return in Bladen County. Thank you for what you said. We can return in Bladen County as being a county that sets a standard for these other counties. We can return. Bleeding County in the hands of God or we can be part of the problem and we will continue being at one another's edge when we stop seeing color and start seeing potential then we will move forward and then we can sing the song of the victory then we can sing the song he's not in the grave anymore then we can sing the song are you washed in the blood then we can sing those old spiritual hymns that we used to sing when we depended on God and for we preachers. How many preachers are here tonight? Amen. Well, wonder where the other some 300 pastors in North <laughs> Bladenburg. I'm not Bladen, excuse me, Bladen County. Churches on every corner. Nobody's got no excuse for not going to church. Am I right? Am I right? <laughs> Somebody said to me, so you go to the church. I said, I live in town building a, a drugstore. <laughs> By his stripes, we were healed. Somebody want to say amen? amen. By his stripes we were I said, you're not complaining about the drugstore, but you will when you go pay the bills. <laughs> Some of you take your tithes and pay, pay the bills out of here. 
about that, I think I think I'm guessing you're busy to talk about so I don't know about that. But when we go back to our Christian heritage, when we depended on God, we'll do something. Amen. Next Monday morning at 8 o'clock in the commissioner's room, Bladen County Courthouse. It was set up some years ago. I believe it was Brother Jimmy Smith that did it. Set up a prayer. The sheriff and his deputies that came, I know they're busy, but every member of any department <coughs> in Bladen County can come and have a brief prayer meeting. And they're not docked for it. Every commission meeting, we have prayer and ask God to guide us and give us the wisdom in our county to be the example that God would have us to be. And we sit back, you know what? Some years ago, I was somehow came across being part of that. Mr. Lila Bank said, but it was illegal. She said, if you don't pray in Jesus' name, who are you going to pray yet? I said, I'm not. <laughs> But then it became legal. You know how? That commissioner's room will fill up if those commissioners don't do what this county thinks. A little problem. But they're not supported in prayer. I asked, was, when I first started, I asked that everyone have an opportunity to come and pray for the commissioners. I lifted in their hands. There was nights that no one showed up. I said, Forget it. I'll do it. From Charles Fred Peterson, from Bullock, from Jimmy Smith. Is there another commissioner here I'm not looking, not seeing? Well, I'm going to ask you this question, just like I asked the back. Why aren't they here? If it's sick, I can understand that. But these are people that are trying to solve the problems. Department head, that are trying to solve the problems so there won't be no racial difference. That we can work together as a community. A God-fearing committee. Yeah. I've been doing the prayer in the first Monday of the month for two years now. Maybe it used to be we'd get a pastor from different churches and different denominations. They just don't show up. But when you show up and you talk about Jesus, then you have a good time. Yeah. Amen. Our county manager's here. Why do I have to beg a preacher to say, well, why don't you come out and pray? Well, I don't have time. I saw you on the golf course. <laughs> I saw I saw you with the boat in the back of the truck. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Our new city police chief. Right, you know, this is that. Not ashamed to pray. He gave a testimony at JCPC Bank that kind of rocked the whole thing. Look at this young man right here. We've got an opportunity. He's real smart, good for. We've got a sheriff that'll pray. If you if you find somebody to pray, let God deal with him. Straighten him out, amen. Well, oh, he straightened me out. <laughs> See, to the North Carolina Highway Patrol, I was driving down the road. I was telling uh, one of our uh, members. I said, so don't get scared driving with me because I drive all over the road. <laughs> I was driving down the road and had one of my former friends with me and the highway patrolman stopped me. I'm not going to call his name. He called me at dinner. <laughs> <laughs> he stopped me. He said, uh, I gave him a license. I said, uh, yeah, I'm fixing a hush. <laughs> he said, when I first started to stop him, he said, I thought you were under influence. I said, no, sir, don't drink. He said, uh, well, I found out I, I followed you for a mile and you've been driving right straight down the middle of the road. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, you got a good explanation? I said, yes, sir. There wasn't nobody coming. Gave <laughs> him my driver's license back. He said, Mr. Hayes, I want to see you the next time on your side of the river. There's good at all. I think we ought to knock off the television that says that's cop. Bad boy, bad boy. If I go in my house, I, I know how to cut it off. I don't even have to get up and walk over to it. I'm going to hush down. All I do is match the button. I was just going to say, I don't even know how you follow up. Um, um, as a pastor, too, 
it goes back to the old adage that says that Sunday mornings are the most segregated morning for day in America. And I think what needs to happen is kind of like what we're doing now. We have to take initiative to cross racial lines, even on Sundays, and worship with each other and not try to be segregated based on ethnicity and race and things like that. Every once in a blue moon, it's okay to kind of cross the street and go visit another church that may be different from you. Because I think when we come together, we find out that we have a lot more in common than we do differences. Um, at the same time, I want to encourage um, my brothers and sisters of other ethnicities um, and uh, cultures is that it is okay to be different. And I think Amen. that we need to celebrate the differences in all of us because that's what makes us so great. Um, we we kind of skate a little bit into a dangerous area when we begin to say, I don't see color. I want you to be able to say that you do see color because that's what makes people great. Learn about a person's culture, where they come from, that makes you more empathetic because now you can understand why they think the way they think, why they approach certain things the way they approach them in the same way. So there needs to be a, a, an exchange between both white, black, Native American, where we can all get together. And I think just not just having this town hall um, but there are all kinds of services that do that. One particular one that I really enjoyed, if you have not gone, every year after the Martin Luther King um, Jr. Parade over at the Presbyterian Church, there is an awesome service um, there. And a lot of times, um, I can pick on my book, we don't go unless we are on, on schedule to sing or we're one of the speakers, but I guarantee you it's probably one of the most phenomenal services that you would attend because it's based in what Dr. King wanted that all um, people of all creeds and backgrounds come together. So I do commend Pastor Dennis for continuing that tradition to continue to have it. Please think about attending this year. There's so many things that we can get involved in. Um, be a part of the Ministerial Alliance. I didn't know about it, but Brother now food get every month. I'm going to see you. Okay, okay. I'm going to be over there. Um, <laughs> so that we can come together. But as pastors, we need to be intentional as leaders to lead our folk over there. And sometimes people are going to kick against it. But if you got one or two, take the one or two. Because a lot of times people are just sitting back waiting to watch is this thing going to be successful? How is this going to go out? But once they see that people are getting along, that we can worship together, they'll start getting on the bandwagon. But we have to start making the initiative to worship together, and we have to do it more than just once every blue moon. Let's make it intentional. Even if we have some type of unity service every quarter here in Bladen County, where everybody can come together regardless of your denominational background, because at the end of the day, when you die, and you close your eyes to open them no more. And you stand up in front of those pearly gates. There is no Baptist section. Amen. There's no Amy Zion section. There's no Pentecostal section. We just, I just want to be in the happy, glad I made it section. <laughs> Which is the only section that there is. Neither is there going to be a black section or a white section. So if we can't get it together down here, we cannot think that we're going to make it up there. So we have to be intentional about coming together and worshiping together and dealing with our issues based in our faith and what Jesus Christ laid out. Amen. Amen. We have about a minute and a half. Do we have any other comments or questions? Yes. Yes, sir. I got a question for the sheriff and the police department here. You said do you have a citizen review board? If you don't, why? Let's, let's, put a, let's put a pin on that and we'll come to law enforcement. Hold, hold on to that one. Okay. Anything else about uh, as far as our pastor? She, she called me out. I am Reverend Chris Liddy from Elizabethtown Presbyterian. And we do celebrate on Martin Luther King Day. We do invite you to come. We have lunch and a nice 
gathering and worship service, I was reflecting with uh, Dr. Ferguson, soon to be Dr. Ferguson. I'll give you that title already, sir. That I'm, I'm a civil rights child. I was born in 1977. This is the way it's always been for me. And I have had the privilege of knowing Cliff Freeman as my neighbor and my friend. Uh, maybe you saw our picture at the football game, watching the Panthers kick some tail. Um, we have been together. We have preached together. We have proclaimed the good news shoulder to shoulder. When, when someone says to me, they start talking in a way that sounds racist to me. I'm quick to say, wait a minute, I will listen to you, but you need to know I stand in a different place from where you are. I may be your pastor, and I will listen to hear you out, but you need to know I'm not there. I'm in a different place. Posted on the walls inside my church is this saying, I'll close with this. You are a child of God, and I will treat you that way. You are a child of God. And I will treat you that way. Amen. There's no qualification, no categories to that. You are made in the image of God. And you will be treated that way. That's what we teach at Elizabethtown Presbyterian Church. I hope you'll come and join us every Sunday at 11. <laughs> But we should. Because the Bible says, For God so loved the world Amen. that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So I said that to say, God didn't just die for black people. He didn't just, or Jesus didn't just die for blacks, or whites, Latinos, or whatever ethnic background that we come from. He died for all of us. We serve a God who has no respect of persons. And as leaders, we have to lead by example. It would be very hypocritical for me as a pastor to say that I don't like this white man. And excuse me, I'm not being ugly, but I'm just saying. Because you all know it happens. And we're going to be real about it. Hello, somebody. So it would be right for me as a pastor to say that I don't like you based on your ethnicity. Because we're supposed to be leading by example. And the Bible says that love covers a multitude of sins. And I'm going to sit down with that because we all have sinned and have come short to the glory. And again, I go back to the cross. And that's why Jesus died for us. So I'm encouraging all of us that we do need to become more ecumenical. We do need to get out of the confinements of these walls and join blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians, or whatever ethnic background and worship because there's only one God and he's a spirit. Amen. Hello, somebody. Yes. We are God's hands. Whether we're white, whether we're black, or whatever, we're his eyes. We're his feet. So he's looking for great expectations out of us. And as Reverend Jessup said, I don't know about you, but there will be no color in heaven. And the Bible says, nothing but the righteous shall see God. There's no color in being righteous. Amen? Amen. Amen. There are the comments, and we'll have some time at the end, and we'll be able to come back. Reverend, I'm sorry. One thing, based on what I'm saying, we have to teach. It starts with teaching our people how to love one another, regardless of how we look, regardless of those who wear sad pants, because everybody is somebody in God's eyesight, and we have to get we have to get across that stereotype. Just because we don't look alike. God still made all of us in his image and in his likeness. And when we go back to the basis of teaching people that Jesus died for all of us, not some people, but for all of us, I think that's where we can really start over in terms of the racism. Any other questions, comments? Uh, should we hold on to them right now? And we'll come back uh, towards the end.
All right, uh, a question, another question for the sheriff. Uh, do you encourage your lieutenants, chiefs, and officers to visit the communities and to get to know the people they protect and serve? If so, how often do you encourage them to, if not, why not? Uh, yes, I do. And since I've come into office, uh, Dr. Taylor and I work very close together. And uh, for financial reasons, some of the school resource officers have been kept. Well, it's still my problem to make sure all the students are safe. I love Dr. Taylor. So what we started was called a 792 and 892 program. And our kids go to the school every day, four or five times a day, unannounced. And we encourage them to have lunch with the students and with the teachers. We encourage them to all the country store. We encourage them to see my yard working, stop and speak. So we highly encourage that. And we do need to know people in this county. And uh, I can tell you for the last 19 months, the deputies are seen more. And I know this is true because people call me all the time and tell me this. Uh, that they get out of the store, they don't think they're above anybody, they don't think they're better than anybody that they're going to sit on the air freight in the stores talking to people there. So yes, we do encourage that. I want to add this uh, with Sheriff Medvick that I have had talk with him and Sergeant Page, and he assured me because Baldwin Branch is located outside of the city limits, and we have talked about security of the church, and he has assured me that he has told his deputies that even if they're in the area when church is going on, to stop in the church. So I do know that the sheriff's department here, we are working on more church security because of the time in which we're living. So I do compliment him on that. And on that note, what I'm telling my, what, what we tell him is to do, go to any church, I don't care where you are. If you work in East Arcadia, go to East Arcadia Church. It's on the back road, whether people see you or not, you're there. So you have to get up and leave, don't disturb the uh, services. So we do that. We have two training officers that go to, they've been to 27 churches so far, helping with the security at the church. And we have to get every one of them. So uh, we do care about Blake County, and we care about the citizens within Blake County. Anyhow, yeah, yes. I just want to add one comment in reference to it. What you're speaking on now. And obviously, a man won't know, don't know how much you care until you know how much they care. And you heard the church speak. And I've been here 65, 66 years, 66 years in that old man. And I had experience, but the experience I had, what was going out of it, and how we lay the count of better than we found. Uh, I had experience, but the church took care of it. And then he sent some folks. Back to see me to really take care of it. And the book stopped there. The ear is off. I mean, my, my heart came out, my stomach came out. I mean, my stress was cut out. But the sheriff took care of it. And he said, supposed to, to make sure it happened. I don't want to say that for him. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yes. Um, when you say community, everybody don't go to church, and everybody does not attend school. What about some of the young people that in the street? Do your office ever communicate with them on a Sunday basis? I'm on a major guy to answer that question. Will you tell me about that this morning? Major guy to address that. I'm Bob. Uh, I'm not a Facebook person. I don't need to be because my wife is. <laughs> and last night, she said, look at this. And she handed me her tablet. And it was a photograph of one of the Elizabeth Town officers. And he was somewhere in Elizabeth Town. I'm not sure exactly where. But he was kneeling down beside his patrol car and he had five or six children. They looked to be from the age anywhere from about six to 10, along in there. They were all grouped around him and they were all smiling. 
and he put it on his Facebook page that he had come across these kids, they started asking him questions, he showed them his patrol car, his blue light, and they ended up taking a photograph. That officer didn't put that on there but for one reason, because he said, this made my day. So, yes, officers are encouraged to be in the community. And I'll give one other example. Uh, <clears throat> when I came on the sheriff's office, we all, sheriff's deputies serve papers. We serve a lot of papers, arrest papers, civil papers. And I was born and raised in the Lisbon area, but I got assigned East Arcadia as my paper service route. Well, after about two months, my papers were piling up in my car, and I had a sergeant that was chewing my butt because I wasn't getting my paper served in a timely manner. And I would go up and ask someone, you know so-and-so, and the immediate answer I got was no. And that was it. And I was riding around one day and I thought to myself, you know, whatever I'm doing, it's not working. So I thought about it and I started getting out of my car. I saw somebody in the garden, I'd get out and go over and talk to them. Hey, how you doing? My name's Larry. I'm working this area. If I can help you, let me know. But, you know, just going to a store, walking in and talking to people. And an amazing thing happened. It got to where I would go by and I'd be talking to somebody and I'd say, do you happen to know so-and-so? And they'd say, yeah, he lives three houses down there. <laughs> and it was such a simple thing. So the answer is yes. For officers to know people in the community, it makes our job easier, plain and simple. And, you know, everybody... No matter how hard working we are, we're all basically lazy and we want to do as little, you know, if it's the easier way to do it, you know, we're going to find the easier way to do it. And for me, it was getting to know the community and them getting to know me. I was just going to ask as a follow-up. It seems as though certainly it's encouraged for um, police officers to get out of their cars and try to you know get involved in the community. Is there ever a point in time that that might be mandated? I just happened to see some things on the news, particularly in the state of New Jersey. Um, uh, there are certain cities in New Jersey, and of course New Jersey is known as the murder capital of the world um, up there, so they have a extensive amount of crime. But they have now implemented where they have um, they're walking the beat, which means officers are required to get out of their cars, walk in the communities on a daily basis, a certain time period where they cannot just drive by, they have to get out, speak to people, that way they can build a rapport with the community. Um, particularly, I guess, to piggyback off of the question that the young lady asked in the back, for um, particularly here in Elizabethtown, because it's hard to do that out in Burl and wide open in the rural areas, but here, where you can kind of get out, get into the community, walk around, get to meet people. Do you ever think there will be a point in which you would require your officers to actually get out, meet people, and so that they'll have a, a report? So if there's ever a domestic call or something, a police officer shows up, that police officer feels comfortable, oh, I know Tom, Dick or Harry, whoever else they're, they're coming up to. So there, there is a level of comfort because you've already established the report. I think it would be better for an uh, officer from a municipality to answer that. And, you know, given that the sheriff's office, we basically patrol the rural areas, it's hard to get out and, and walk. They're all basically late. Do I think it'll be mandated? I, I don't think it will because I feel like officers are doing it. I try to set the example myself. Uh, I try to guide office every now and then when I go to downtown, which is not very helpful. And get out and uh, ride around in town. And if I see someone out, I try to get up and stop and talk, chit chat. Uh, 
just the other Monday, I, mean, I was talking, there was three gentlemen standing there, I stopped and talked to them for almost an hour. And I encourage our guys, to, when, you, when you're getting out, when you're riding around, see people on the side of the road, don't just drive by, <coughs> stop, speak to them for a few minutes, get to know the folks. Uh, because it builds, it, like I said, it builds that rapport with the community and lets them know that, hey, we care. And we do care. Um, we see a lot of bad things going on. And uh, when you don't know the people in your communities, it's, it's easy to turn the cheek or you, you hear something bad. But if, if the officer out in the community is getting to know the people, and they hear something, they'll say, no, I know the officer. He's not like that. And so I feel it's really, really important to do that. Um, like I, I've said in another uh, forum, I applied for a grant through Homeland Security to be an officer for nothing solely for uh, community policing, where he can go out and implement programs in the community with kids, with the building. That would be his sole responsibility is just getting out, meeting people, and, and building that rapport, helping people, and, and getting their input or, or how they feel about things, where we can implement programs to help them. Um, so hopefully I will have to mandate our officers to get out and meet people. I hope they continue to follow in the footsteps that I'm doing and is voluntarily getting out there and meet people. And I see our guys out doing that. So hopefully, like I said, we'll have to mandate this for people to come out. Just to add on to that, I think that's kind of the underscores the importance of events like tonight so that we can share information and community can understand type of outreach that is going on from law enforcement uh, in Blade County. And just to kind of address the question uh, from the back, uh, you asked particularly about the youth. While uh, law enforcement is doing outreach, outreach uh, with businesses, with uh, churches in the community, you got to understand, they may not have an interaction with young people every day, but their friends and family do. And it's, a, it's very important that the people closest around them reinforce that not every law enforcement officer is a bad law enforcement officer. In fact, most of them are good. If you reinforce that at home and spread that to the young people that you see every day, then that spreads throughout the community. And some of the negativity that's on the 24-hour news cycle, right. with your right. CNN and your Fox News, all of that gets wiped away and undercut because they start to learn about the good that is going on in the community. And so it's uh, a responsibility for all of us to hold one another accountable and to let everyone know in the community what's going on. So let's do that. Yes, sir. Uh, just as a chief pass, I would just like to say, um, it's not being done in the black community with the officers. They are not a the community. I'm a lifelong resident of Little Town, lived in the city of Memphis all my life. To the best of my knowledge, I know the name of two police officers. I mean, they, they don't, there's no outreach in the black community. <coughs> I mean, uh, whatever they're doing up town, maybe working up there, but there's none out here. I mean, with the young kids, with the older adults and stuff, the officers are just not reaching out. I mean, they, they come out of, they very rarely get out of the car. Uh, they, I've never seen them have any interaction with any of the community out here on Martin Luther King, <coughs> except to perform an arrest. You know. And if anyone knows of anything of a different than what I'm saying, please enlighten me. And one other thing I have to say in favor of Chief, Chief uh, Sheriff McVeigh. Uh, a lady was telling me last week that uh, one of your officers came in, her officers came in, her house and said, hey. And she said he was a little rough to begin with. And she called, you know, why are you being so racist? Why are you acting like that? And she said, when she said the word race, he fell apart. So he said, I'm oh, saying that, the uh, chief, chief that visited on top of that man, he got to see him. You can never hear no race. That's one for you. <laughs>
So, like I said earlier, I'm hoping by they'll follow my footsteps I get out and meet the place. Because I know it's important. And like I said, I don't know what's happened in the past before I got here. I can only tell you what's going to happen from now into the future. Um, like I said, all of you seen the black Dodge Charger with Kenneth Winters riding around? That's me. Every day when I go to lunch, I try to ride around with for at least 15 to 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and I'll stop and talk to folks. And sometimes I get mixed reactions, and I'll look at you like, what do you want? <laughs> Which I understand that you're not sure you might just see him on these over there. And I'm usually dressed like this, I'm wearing a uniform right now. Um, but I, I am out there, I am stopping and talking to folks. And like I said, I encourage my guys to do the same thing. And I will follow up on that board to make sure it gets me in dust. I want to do it because I want to. It makes a big difference when someone's going from because of something they want to do versus something they're told to do. And, and people perceive that also. So like I said, you know, roll with them come night. Just be a little bit patient with me and we'll get there. See, historically, there is a distrust in the African American community and police. Yes. This is what this night should be about. It should be about a start. And the brother has already alluded to the fact that maybe on MLK, they have not seen the end of the city police officer. The next time we come together, then the point of accountability will be there. We'll be able to say since the last time we met, we've seen more police officers back there. But that's what causes the distrust. <coughs> Nobody's being held accountable. See, we can come to meetings like this, and we can say this, and we can say that, and we can satisfy the soul for each person in here, but then we need to go out and see the reaction. See, so, so it's up to us in here to make this thing work. So the next time that conversation comes up, say, well, we and Chief said, we'll see guys walking. So when we see these officers walking down the streets, we won't get along. Because, see, the first thing they see now, when they see a uh, policeman, there's a barrier that comes up. And that just, this didn't just happen. This is historic. It's born within us in a sense. Or soon as after we're born, if people walk in the they go to the police, you better run. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from the hood. I mean, I know. So that's it's up to all of us in here tonight in order to make it into the time we that we support the chief and say that things are going to change. As you said, wrong will not be up in the day. But everybody that's coming tonight, we have to be held accountable and make an effort to make this not just be a meeting, but let this be a plan of action and then execute the action. So we'll be we'll, with we'll, Follow up on what I'm saying. Please pass along to your folks. That if the police get out and start walking, they're not necessarily looking for someone. <laughs> 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 a gentleman and a younger uh, teenager there sitting on the porch. I pulled up in the driveway and got out and walked up. He said, hey, how y'all doing today? They're like, they're like staring at me. I said, hey, I introduced him. I said, hey, I'm going to walk to my new chief in town. I just want to get out and ride around. Yeah, that was what he meant. So just meet and talk with folks. Still no response. I'm not looking for anybody. I'm trying to get information. I just want to chit chat, talk to them, say, introduce myself so you know who I am. Then they started coming around a little bit. We started talking a little bit. And I told them, I said, you know, you're probably seeing me out from time to time, so next time I stop, feel free to talk. And like I said, they started warming up a little bit. So just tell your friends and your, and your family that when you see the police officers out walking, they're not necessarily looking for someone, so don't take off work. <laughs>
But what they don't realize, that can be your child standing there. Everybody is somebody. So we need to get off our high horses and start trying to help our people. <coughs> not only our people, everybody. Um, next question is, um, uh, I'm just going to put it out here as it was asked. Uh, are racism and prejudice problems in Bladen County and or Elizabeth Town? If so, what steps are we taking to change that reality or have we accepted it and decided to live with it? Again, are racism, and this is open to anybody on the panel, are racism and prejudice problems within Bladen County and or Elizabeth Town? If so, what steps are we taking to change that reality, or have we just accepted it and decided to live with it? Well, I think that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, there is um, certainly a problem with racism. Um, it's something that has been the underbelly um, of our area for quite some time. As far as what steps that are being taken, I think the initial meeting that we had over at Community College, what we're doing now, and again, to piggyback off of what Pastor Boykin has said, is that after each time we come together, there needs to be objectives, and they need to be measurable, at least, to see that we're making progress. Racism is something that is taught it is not something that you are born with, and anything that can be taught can also be unlearned. But we have to be willing to have these difficult conversations, to come together, um, to have these types of meetings, um, for our faith leaders to lead the way in having inter-faith um, worships with one another. Um, there are things that are being done in the White Oak community. Um, White Oak Baptist Church um, has workout classes that I ain't been to in a while, I'm so sorry I've been working, um, that we can come together as a community. We have community clubs in um, our area that's open to everyone to become in, and to be involved. Um, so I think it's just important for us to just come together. And sometimes we have to lay it all out there on the line. All these conversations are not gonna be touchy-feely, let's high-five each other conversations. But we can't deal with the problem unless we first address what the issue is and move forward. And then hold each other accountable um, as a community because even with our own, within our own communities, we got issues. So we got to tackle issues within our own communities and then we have to do it together as a collective community as well. So it's important that we educate ourselves. A lot of stuff that we do is I would say 90% done out of ignorance because we don't know. And we will dismiss that what we don't understand. So we have to come together, learn from one another, and hold each other accountable. And that's what's going to make the difference. And understand that it's going to take time, and you just can't have one service, one meeting, and expect to change the world in two hours. It just ain't really going to happen. But if we are intentional about what we're doing and have ongoing conversations and coming together, I think it can make a difference. Um, that's all I can impart. Just continue the conversations and keep it going. Can I ask a question? I thought you brought up to the point. How can we create an environment where we hold each other accountable without not holding each other accountable, escalating into personal attacks right. and increase racism and violence? What can, what can we do to create an environment where we can hold each other accountable? And I don't take it personally, you call me on my next. Absolutely. Um, I think we, we just have to be adults about the situation. We have to check egos at the door, right? I mean, we're human. Nobody likes to be corrected. Let's, let's just be honest, right? I, you know, I live at home with my mom. You know, I'm grown, but I'm probably facing the eviction notice when I get there. <laughs> all egos at the door. You know, all titles, you know, I like the way the pastor led, you know, I, I do not, will, will probably never introduce myself as reverend because my birth certificate says Pia. It did not say reverend. I, we are one and the same. We go through some of the same things and I think once we begin to peel off those layers, 
of feeling like we're entitled or we deserve something, I think that helps us not to take things personally. And also when you know law enforcement um, coming out here and explaining to us what the process is, a lot of us just are really ignorant. We don't know because we haven't gone through training. So by you educating us, we know better now in terms of what we need to do. And I think it's important for us who've been watching the news, every now and again, turn it off. Um, because in journalism, we also learn that if it leads, it leads. So they're going to go with the most undercutting, negative story because that's going to get the most press. They're not going to go and cover a story such as this, where people are coming together trying to unify, but they're quick to go somewhere where there's a protest, people, you know, killing each other in the streets because that's what's going to get the most press. Encourage your young people at home. Social media is great, but every now and again, we got to back away from social media because it's also killing us because our kids don't know how to interact with one another. They don't know how to write anymore. You put them in a room. They don't know how to conversate. But you can put those same 10 kids in a room and give them phones. They'll have a whole conversation via text message. Right? So we have to understand how we're interacting with one another on a daily basis and teaching them, like the gentleman said, self-respect. If self-respect isn't in the home, they're not going to respect the officer that's coming up. So we need not have a question, why did they do this, why did they do that? Respect wasn't the standard immediately. So we have to do better with teaching one another, and particularly teaching our next generation coming up, so they know how to handle certain situations. But I think for adults, we just have to, titles, ego, all of that has to be checked at the door. And if we're wrong, we have to readily say, I messed up. And if you don't know the answer to something, guess what? I don't know. 66 books in the Bible. I teach Bible study. I get asked questions all the time because people just assume that the pastor knows everything. Guess what? It's like we don't. But we can pray about it and talk about it together. And we can come up with a solution together. But we have to say, I'm sorry. If we learn this stuff in kindergarten, if you make, if you make a mess, clean it up. If you hurt somebody, apologize and mean it, right? So we have to be sincere about what we're doing. We have to be genuine about what we're doing because our young people are watching and they can smell a hypocrite from a mile away. They really can. So don't feel, you know, officers, that you got to know the lingo, that you got to know how to teach me how to doogie and all of that stuff. If you're corny, they'll still love you if you're corny. They really will. Be yourself. Be who you are, and kids appreciate authenticity every single time. You know what I'm saying? Because they're watching us. So we have to really set the tone and set the example. But kids learn from us because we don't act right. So they emulate what they see. So until we get it together, how can we expect our young people really know how to interact with one another? So I think that's important so that we can have those checks and balances. Last yeah. question uh, about race um, within the departments, um, within the counties, and whatever the state works in Portland, they work with. Why is there more variety in color as what the officers are? Instead of 95% or 90% of the officers being white, that that holds back a lot of times in a neighborhood where if that's all they see, and then sometimes a lot of the officers are from the neighborhood, and if you see an officer all the duty out of uniform that's hanging with the crowd that has rubber flags in the back of the truck or on their on their vehicle, but yet you see it the next day he's in uniform in a police car. It's kind of hard to approach that person with an open mind as to say in my heart, you are not friends. Or if you go on law enforcement, every police car you see has a white officer in it. I mean, do anybody else come apply for an application to be an officer? Or you know, is there certain qualifications or shouldn't the departments 
should they reflect what come the community is? If the community is half black and half white, should it be that same reflection in the, in the department as who they hire and how they hire? If you want to reflect the community, be a part of the community. Because a lot of times the uniform don't change what's in a person's heart. All it does is get an appearance. But to know what a person is, a lot of times if, 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 if a pastor is poor fit, he's not going to be what he is outside the street. And if an officer, as long as he got that uniform on and, he, and he's in that car, he, he there, there are times I, I've seen officers in school pass them, spoke to them, read and say, how you doing? Well, I'm not about to be standing there. You know, this, this is uh, city, county, I, I, not, not so much as how they patrol a lot of times they have roadblocks. They're very efficient, very friendly, you know, on the point, not trying to separate nobody, you know, but I'm just saying what it is the way it is. Is what I see, what I see. Okay, so I got, I got two or three different questions with what you're saying. Are, are, you, are we speaking about the overall issue of racism in Elizabethtown? Are we speaking about the lack of African American presence on the police force? We talk about it all. Okay. okay. Lack, lack of presence on the police force means that there's no communication between communities. It's not being trusted. Like I said again, if you see somebody on the police force, that had a rubber flag on the back of his truck. Again, the next day you see him in a police car. How are you going to interact with the community? Gotcha. Okay. Uh. I don't want to answer that question from the law enforcement. Um, I, I do want to address the original question that you asked about race relations and, and racism and things of that nature. I do know that the sheriff has talked about the recruitment efforts um, and the lack of candidates. Uh, it's the same thing that we face in public education. Uh, we would certainly like our teaching staff to reflect uh, our population in the school district. Uh, the problem is that we don't have viable applicants. You can bring me a black male uh, who's qualified and certified to teach our hiring today and, and three times on the weekend. Uh, you can bring me a white male uh, and I'll hire him. The problem is that we don't have a minority of people going into education. We don't have people, period, not going into education. And I know the sheriff had spoke to that, I think, uh, at the last conversation that we had. It's really about having applicants to apply uh, and that if they are viable candidates and meet all the uh, the standards, and by all means, you're going to hire those people. Uh, we certainly want to reflect that in the neighborhood. Uh, so I hope that is kind of what the sheriff will say or anything else. I want to ask you the other part of the question that was really originally asked, man. And since I'm, I'm on this panel, I'm leaving to be able to say something. I've got to sit up quiet. Uh, I'm not an old man. Uh, I'm almost 50 years old. Uh, but when it comes to race relations, it, Understanding, understanding of it, I think um, I have a pretty broad understanding and, and a pretty broad experience. Uh, when you ask a question about racism in Blake County, does it exist? Uh, the answer is obviously yes. Uh, for anyone to say that it doesn't exist, it would be a fool. We have approximately 35,000 people in Blake County. If there was one person that was racist, uh, their racism exists. Uh, what we have to ask ourselves is uh, what kind of racism how has racism evolved over time and what are the differences that we now see? Uh, as I told you at the beginning, I'm from Mississippi. And uh, if you want to talk about polar opposites, and all of Mississippi is not what you think, I believe. Most people are hardworking people, uh, but there are some things that are a little more uh, uh, poignant uh, in that state. Uh, when I first moved here, I moved to uh, Cumberland County, coming from Mississippi. Uh, Cumberland and Fayetteville, a very cosmopolitan place. People, soldiers from all over the world. I uh, had an opportunity to live and work in Clinton uh, for eight years. And when I went from Cumberland to Clinton, absolutely. Uh, I kind of felt that I had went back into a time war. I said, wait a minute now, something a little different here. Uh, and, and Blake County is you know, kind of similar. I don't see uh, um, the in-your-face racism. Uh, that we think of from the 1950s and the 1960s. That just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it's more now uh, what we need to do to improve each other individually. And we have to grow as individuals in our beliefs and what we think about people. Uh, and I've had to go through that own growth of my own. I, I'll give you an example. 
um, um, having to speak in front of people all the time. Uh, I quite often receive compliments that you, know, you spoke so well, you did a, such a wonderful job, I, blah, 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 you know. And, uh, and initially when these things were said to me, my response was, well, what's the fact black man can't get up and talk? <laughs> and that was, and I was always nice and I was always friendly. And I had a, a, a person that I knew, a former board member, and you know, Georgina Zing, uh, and she's Chinese. So we were having a conversation uh, and she said, well, Robert, uh, what you got to understand is that sometimes when people give you those compliments, they actually mean it. And it's not that they're patronizing. So I had to do some self-examination about what I thought people thought about me when I got up in front of the crowd and began to speak. Uh, so those are the type of things that we have to do to individually improve ourselves. Uh, race relations to me is, is like cancer. Uh, I believe as a nation we've gone through chemotherapy and the tumor continues to shrink. And what we have to do as a community, as a nation, is to continue to receive that treatment uh, so that one day we can eradicate the cancer. Uh, when you look around this room, most of us are people that are 50 or older, somewhere in that range, which means that we grew up uh, with this as a part of our existence. Uh, we learned it from our parents. Uh, as African Americans, it's very rare that you're gonna have a family that has not been touched by violence uh, uh, from that era in our time. Uh, even though we may not have done it, but we, we know about it. Uh, my grandfather was murdered in the car next to my mom, who was also uh, hit by some of the buckshot. So this is something that I knew about and experienced as a child growing up, uh, understanding that was a part of what could happen in the community. Uh, that is why we talk to our children about how you act, how you go out into the public, the type of things that you do. I do that with my own children because uh, what I do believe is that I have to educate them about what the world is really like and how you change the world. Uh, so even though uh, I'm in somewhat of a box, uh, it's my duty to expand what it is that I do for my children. But I also never really understand that as a community, uh, and I've heard people talk to this tonight, we've got to deal with our own business. Uh, we've got to teach our children how to act and how to respect. Uh, I talked with a parent uh, who, whose child cussed out Dr. Ray, uh, the principal at, um, at West at East Bladen High School. And through the course of the conversation, I asked a question. Uh, I just simply have to ask you, ma'am, uh, all things being equal, uh, do you think it's okay? Do you condone your son using that kind of language with the principal? And at the end of that conversation, uh, she had to say, well, well, no, I don't. So the first thing we have to do is to make sure that, uh, that our children understand what is appropriate behavior. Uh, so when you do get pulled over by someone, uh, who is a racist person, who wants to exercise uh, the authority that they have on the side of the road. You have to do everything that you can as an individual not to give them a reason to do so. Uh, when we talk about going through the roadblock, uh, the first thing we have to understand is don't be out riding dirty. If you know your license are suspended, or you know you've been out drinking and driving, you need to handle that business. Uh, uh, the last time I checked, uh, there was no bull coming or uh, uh, George Wallace at the schoolhouse door at any of our schools. So what we've got to do is make sure that we take advantage of the educational opportunities that are there, uh, that we come and talk with teachers about what we can do at home uh, to, to make those situations better for our children. Uh, and if you really want to understand what it should look like, come to a kindergarten class. Come to any one of my kindergarten classes and you will see uh, little black boys little white boys and Hispanic boys and girls, all races and creed in the room playing together uh, with nothing about race in their mind. So the thing that I like about Bladen County is that we are having these conversations, uh, but when we think about the things that have happened in the media with the police, uh, and I told the person I was talking with uh, Rocio Bollinger, who's uh, assistant principal at, at Tar Heel Middle School, she's Hispanic. And I said, well, Rocio, I have to tell you that uh, we do have these situations, uh, and it's bad. Uh, but it's a uh, hundred times better than it used to be. I said, the people think it's bad now. They need to go back to 1970 and think about what people have to do. We, we've come a long way. Are we where we need to be? Absolutely not. Uh, do we have those kind of issues in Blake County with police officers? I would have to say that the answer is no. Uh, 
even though there may be uh, individual situations where someone is fumbled, uh, individual situations where a cop may be a little more aggressive than he has to be, uh, but my experience has been uh, that we don't have anything near the level of what they may have to do in Chicago or New Jersey or places like that. Uh, so what I hear from these gentlemen is that uh, they're working diligently uh, to try and improve their putting programs, and I know that the sheriff has his officers come out. Uh, uh, they have an opportunity to speak with kids. Uh, we have a new chief in town. They're doing those things. So are we where we need to be? Absolutely not. Uh, but I know that as an individual, it's really about how I do self-examination and what is it that Robert has to do in order to make those changes. So uh, I see those changes in my children. I see those changes so that when my daughter graduated from high school and people came to the house, you would thought you were at the UE. And that really kind of made me feel good. So I, I'll stop them. I'm, I'm sure I'll save you my time. <laughs> question about the lack of black folks in the police department. Uh, I was sworn in April 1st, but I was there at the department for two months prior to that, so from February 1st I've been in the department. In that time period, I've had one black male come in to apply. And when he came in, he brought his packet to me, and which you don't know that to do a, a background of a person to get them hired, it's very lengthy, a lot of paperwork, it's a lot of work. This gentleman came in and told me that um, he wanted to apply for a job, so okay. And he also told me that uh, he had lost his certification and training standards were told, this was back in May, that uh, if he could get certified before August, that they would renew the certification, and that he had an interview the following week with the Wilmington Police Department and with Leland Police Department. And I asked him, I said, well, if you have an interview already scheduled with those departments, obviously you're willing to process, why are you coming here? He said, well, I figured I could uh, rush through and get my certification, get you to swear me in and keep my certification. And just last week, or, or this week I was telling you, I was, I was talking to some folks, and uh, they asked me the same question. Why don't you have more black to report? And I, I was telling the story, and I said, well, let me ask you this. I said, I've had one person come in. If you're in my shoes and this man comes in and he says, I just want you to hold my certification because I'm going to work somewhere else next week, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> What are y'all doing to recruit more African American, more ethnic within the department? If, if nobody want to come into a department that should have everybody in, that means there's something wrong with that apartment. Department nobody wants to be a part of it. You have to feel like you're a part of something or to be in that and, and participate as the I, I, I can't believe that out of Lake County. You know, all the ethnicities, all the codes in the Lake County, it shouldn't be as it is now. They may, it may be acceptable to some, but it, it should be reflected into the community, and we don't have that in, in, on the department. There's something maybe be done with the ones that are at the top to recruit, to like the military, they recruit a, a variety of codes. They don't recruit just one code, and if they don't, there's something wrong with the recruiting they replace him. But there, there be something that should be put in place to attract the attention of the African American male, the Hispanic male, or, or the Asian male, or, or female, whichever it may be, to attract them to want to become a part of that department or a part of that program that people are running. But if you feel like they don't need you going in there because you got 90 percent white, and then I'm the only black coming in, then I'm not going to feel like I'm not going to climb. I'm not going to get the uh, help for promotion. Still, that's not be blind to what's going on. You still have the little boy syndrome that still exists. That, that, that has disappeared. I'm not talking about anything. I'm just saying what I'm saying because what I'm saying is true. But we have to make sure that if we want the, the, our department, the department to be successful, then we need to put more effort and bring about that kind of success. Can you just jump in to kind of like defend? Uh, I hear what you're saying. I just retired from the State Fire Patrol after 26 years. We have recruiters that go out and actively seek applicants. They go all places. 
colleges, military, schools, they got everywhere trying to recruit people of all colors. My last seven years, six years on patrol, I was a first sergeant in charge of Lady Columbus County. Prior to that, I was sergeant in charge over in uh, Robinson County. During that time frame, and I know we do recruit because the recruiters are required to go out and recruit. I did not have people, black folks, come in to apply. Um, it's a nationwide trend. It's not just this town, this park. It's not the Highway Patrol. It's not the Lady County Sheriff's Department. It's a nationwide problem. And I can't hire them if they don't apply. Now, you talk about the good old boy system and, and not being able to just, uh, I currently have two black males in my department. And I just hired a female recently. One of the black males is a sergeant. You talk about the good old boy system, you can't, they can't advance. Well, that was my number one goal was to do the good old boy system. I created a promotional process, and the people that went through the promotional process, they had to meet certain criteria to get into it, and then they got points for different aspects throughout the process. My number one person was a black male, and he'll be sworn in Monday night, town council meeting, if any of you would like to come and see. So the good old boy system we're talking about is no longer at the Midtown Police Department, I can promise you. Um, I've created a performance appraisal system, a promotional process that's based off solely on right and wrong answers. Not There's nothing in there where someone would say, well, you gave me more points because he's black, you gave me more points because he's white. Everything has a right or wrong answer that's in black and white, and I can show you why you got it right or why you got it wrong. So no one can say that I'm doing that. You know, I understand the good old boy system has been the norm in years past, but I can promise you from April 1st forward, it's no longer there. If you don't believe me, you can ask any one of the guys in my park. So, you know, as far as getting the applicants, I can't make them come. If they come, I can give them a fair chance. But I can't make them come. So if you can bring them to me, to the Sheriff's Department, to the Highway Patrol, by all means, bring them. Like the police chief in Dallas said, get off the protest line, get your application, and turn it in, you can make a change. That's all I can ask. So if any of you know, Someone that's 20 or above. You can go, I've got a website that I just created. It's got all the criteria you need to, to apply for a police position. It's got all the forms there. I made it easy for you. It's out there. It's on the internet. Everybody's got to <coughs> Tell me to go there, fill out the forms, fill out the application, and bring it to me. Lieutenant Michael does my background investigations, and we'll assure you that we'll get the most qualified people, irregardless of color. There were several things I wanted to say with so much missing, but I think I hit, hit something earlier. I heard you talk about the lack of applicants, and this is a revelation I just received, something that I said earlier. As a little child, we are taught that policeman is our enemy. And maybe we haven't realized that. So very few uh, African Americans grow up want to be a policeman. So that could contribute to the reason we don't have the super applicants. Because now I have two brother-in-laws that are deputies. One is Sampson County deputy, one is Wake County deputy. Ex-brother-in-law is retired highway patrolman. And one of my best friends, uh, the best sheriff in Sampson County is Jimmy Thorne. <laughs> so maybe that's what it is but what I want to go back to the original question does racism exist in Lake County racism exists in America and if you don't think it exists everywhere between all of us the question was asked what do we need, the way I see this thing like on the sports call slip saw it at the beginning of the first Gulf War I followed that war that a veteran and what the general said was we have identified the enemy. Now we're going to kill it. We have identified the enemy tonight in Blake County. Yes, racism exists, but now we got to kill it. How are we going to kill it? Through education. Through gatherings like this, where we can come together and learn to appreciate each other instead of tolerate. You see, it's a difference in me appreciating my differences. It's talking about the churches coming together. 
African Americans can come to a white church and the more the same. Stand there like Charles Stanley. <laughs> but we gotta learn to appreciate the difference. Because Charles Stanley, one of the greatest altars and preachers that there was. Dr. Temple was saying that in South County, his all talking skills is what amazed the people. But not looking at the color of his skin. So we have to learn to appreciate. That's what each other have the brain. Our differences is what makes us great. And when we educate each other, and be able to gather like this and talk about these differences and realize that we all care, we all love, we all bleed. See, that's the problem with the people that have a problem with the slogan, Black Lives Matter. If they would have put up their Black Lives Matter also, that might have been more self-explanatory. But what it's saying is not saying that everybody's life doesn't matter, but it seems as though our lives was a don't matter because of the actions that we have seen being taken. That, that's all that meant. Everybody is somebody. It's already been alluded to. God made us all. So the thing we have to do is get to know each other. Amen. You know, in preacher, there are three styles of preacher. You have extemporaneous, you have outline, and you have manuscript. Extemporaneous preachers stand there and take the Bible, don't have anything written down. Manuscript preacher like me, I write everything down. And, and outline preachers just hit those points. But they are three preachers. So what we got to realize is no matter the color of our skin, we are still somebody and we have differences. We have differences of opinion. There's some stuff I might go along in my house. Now that other people want to sit back there. Raise your hand, baby. So don't want to be no problem. So if we're going to have some differences of opinion, of course we all want to have differences of opinion, but the same thing that works for her and I have been together 28 years called communication. We don't tolerate each other, we appreciate each other. And so we all can learn to communicate and appreciate our differences, then racism, prejudice will still exist. Bladen County, peace out Bladen County, 
by Blaine County, but it's amazing what you will say out loud and the Lord will have you eat your words. <laughs> because I had no plan in coming back here, but I know it was nobody but the Lord that brought me back and now wanted me to have a passion to want to be involved in the community because I see how the community, you know, over time has gone down. But it's not going to change unless we get involved and change it. So we have to not just um, as young people and those of us who are going off to college, yes, it's difficult, but everything is not about making all the money that you can. Money is great, but money is not everything. Come back, rebuild our communities, work, get involved in our communities, and make a difference. Because if not, if we don't come back and make a difference, then who will? It's our community, and we have to take initiative, and we have to take ownership of it and foster important, positive roles of what it means to be African-American, Caucasian, and being a part of law enforcement because we all have a place. But I think if we change the attitude of law enforcement, particularly with our young people, I think you'll start to see more of them saying, I want to be a part of the police department or I want to be on the sheriff's department and see to make a difference. Um, and I think one of my classmates that I graduated with, he's on the sheriff's department, I can't call his name right now, but he's, he's African American, but um, it's, it's important that we do that. And so that state, you know, social media is okay, but in news clips, they don't always show the whole story. So have those conversations with your kids. Don't just leave it at that. You know, have the conversation. We can't put everything on the teachers to teach your children everything. You can't put everything on the Board of Education to supply your kids with everything in the world. I wouldn't have made it as far as I made it had my parents not sat down, given me other things to do, send me off, let me have exposure. If all I had was what I learned in Blaine County school system and that was it, heaven help me. You can't put it all on law enforcement to say, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, and then we sit back and do nothing. We have to do our part because it's a partnership. We have to have a certain um, respect for law enforcement, and we have to see it go both ways. And it goes back to the accountability when it's not happening. They're letting us know what the policies are, that we can, the avenues that we can approach in the event that we've done what we're supposed to do, and on their end they have not. You know, um, Chief Parrish, I think you mentioned that on the first um, meeting that we had at BCC, that we could go to the website and there are agreements, there's a process that we could go through. A lot of times we don't want to go through the process. We just want what we want. This is not Burger King. You just don't snap your fingers and stuff. I, I immediately, I get justice. It really don't work like that. We've got to go through a process. You know, uh, um, Sheriff McVickers has let us know what his process is. Going back to what um, Pastor Boykin said, here are objectives that are measurable. So the next time we get together, we should be able to have some positive feedback. I've seen offices in my community. People have gotten out and they've spoken with me. Um, I, as pastors, I know I'm on Sunday, I'm gonna let my people know, if you see the offices, if you see the police, have a conversation with them. They're not out you know, looking or trying to get information. They're trying to foster. But we have to get the information out. Because clearly 35,000 people are not here. But we can be the mouthpiece to spread the word to get it around. So we have to change the culture ourselves and not just keep it all on one particular group of people and expect them to do the work and we sit back and do nothing. We have to get involved. Well. We have we have about seven minutes. We're gonna come here and we're gonna come to Pastor Hayes. We'll come here. Is racism alive and well in Green County? It certainly is. And, um, and uh, you've already said that you, know, you have to make people accountable. But the reality is that uh, we as black people have to be accountable and we, for things that are happening in our neighborhood. But we also have to make uh, people that are in leadership positions accountable. Um, when you have Blaine Community College, I came back 13 years ago, and you had uh, all of those uh, staff <coughs> teachers, and you all had two uh, black instructors, you know, and then you had people in continuing ed teaching, making $15 an hour, but you had 
instructors make it thirty dollars an hour, and then you know they were archaic. And then you went to the county government, and you had a personnel manager with a master's degree from North Carolina State, African American, and she was looking at the salaries of department heads that had high school diplomas and were making sixty and seventy thousand dollars a year. That's the crazy stuff going on. And what has happened is, we just sit there and like it's all right. And we talk about the police department. Yeah, who wants to? Who wants to come in? Join the police department when we got to old boys. And I know it's different times to change. But what I'm saying is, we as a people have to stop making people accountable. We got to stop that sitting there, just allowing things to happen. And I think one of the team may have said, um, that it's not the folks that put on the white uh, hood and stuff. You know, none of the ones that don't have the right. It's the ones that stick in there, not saying anything, <laughs> when an injustice is happening. We got to make people accountable. And black and white folks, because let's see, our kids, as you already said, our kids cut the food, they have to be crazy. They are. We're not just cut the say all of them are right. But what has happened is we got these uh, technology, we got these cams, video, everybody. This is what it's called. Box and box and whatever. What it is, this stuff been happening. They been beating us. Killing us. You know, you can hang us up. I know I'm not a racist, but I just. But what has happened is God is allowing this stuff to happen. And I know you're talking about the media and Jonas, but it's free. It's happening. It's happening right here, right now. So we got to start, as y'all already tell me you've done it. We got to make people accountable. And we can't just say, oh, but I haven't been experienced with this person. And everything is all right. You know what that is? Okay. Uh-huh. We're definitely not saying that here. We just want to begin that. Difficult conversation, as you're saying. We got to talk to about it. We got to be about it. That's right. That's right. Let's keep going. Pastor Hayes, we're going to come here and we're going to come talk about it. Let, let me share this with you. I'm 66 years old. I'm 66 years old. In the 60s, they took five black students from the black school to the white school that I attended. Yes, I was raised up in the 50s, born in 1949. I was raised up in a mixed community that we had to work together to make it to the winter. This young black girl was sitting outside on the doorstep of Red Springs High School. After she had been ridiculed in an algebra class, pointing the fingers and all the things that were said. And I was the big, bad, white boy. And I stood there and watched that young lady cry. And I went over and I sat down beside her. And I said, what's the problem? She said, you wouldn't understand because you're white. I said, let me share something with you. My grandma was a Cherokee Indian. Mm-hmm. My daddy visited my mother at the hospital and said he had a date. I grew up in the 50s. I was a little bastard half-breed. I knew what it is to be called names. And I called that young lady by her name and I put my arm around her. And she hugged my neck. You know what it caused? It caused a love connection between me and her that lasted until this very day. I still love that girl, and she loved me. Because we've got a Christ-like love, and it's a binding love. There's three pastors on this panel. Here's the DA, the school system, and our police department, our sheriff's department, our police department. Folks, let me tell you something, racism, is in America, and it is in Bladen County, but it, when we wake up to love one another and understand one another and share the difference that we grew up 
with one another. And we can go over and put our arms around and say, Sheriff, what can I do? Chief, what can I do? I believe it was Kennedy that said, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Let me ask you this. Ask not and criticize not our educational system or our police departments or our faith communities. Forget about the past. It's time for the white man to quit putting the black man in the cotton field and it's time for the black man to get out of the cotton field. It's time to put the past behind, look to the future. God said that the present is a gift, the present. We can do something about it. We can change what's took in place in the past, but we can be the people that makes a difference tonight. <coughs> Reverend Boykin, he said, we identified the enemy. The enemy is not the pastor. The enemy is not. There's more behind that than you know. Ronald Tillman, an African American. Consultant, North Carolina consultant for the JCPC. Dr. Taylor, Bladenboro School Superintendent, give him a hand. <laughs> I said, hey, hold on a minute, Dr. Taylor. I called him a few other things. I said, hold on. I said, How can you shake his hand that way and you don't shake my hand that way? And we've been shaking hands like we're brothers ever since. <laughs> This day, our judicial system is here, folks. You've heard it beat tonight. Well, well, you've heard our North Carolina Highway Patrol. That man gave a good speech tonight, didn't he? Our sheriff's department. Folks, if you don't like us, love us enough to pray for us. Blame <laughs> 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 one another. And let's stand together, amen? amen. That's what God created love. Amen. Come very, very quick, very quick. Hey, do it. I'm, my name is David Price. I'm the assistant chief there at White Oak Fire Department. I moved here 17 years ago. Mississippi boy myself. <laughs> First time I saw Miss Tia, she was a member. She come join the fire department. Two uncles were founding members of the White Oak Fire Department. Mr. Butch Jessup. Mr. Robin is a great people. Volunteer fire department, volunteer rescue squad. We need help. The community that we live in, we serve. When the pager goes off, 911 goes off, they don't say, you've got a white person in a red car. <laughs> 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 We have everybody gear up, face mask, turn out gear, everything. And I challenge the people in the audience, you tell me who's black, who's white, who's male, who's female. You can't tell. <laughs> we don't care. We train together. We, we need members. If you work with the fire department, you deal with reps. We deal with sheriff's department. We deal with highway patrol. You get to know each other. What we're doing here, Miss Pierce. We've known each other for years. <laughs> you know, I watched her grow up. <laughs> you know people, you realize each other, you realize your differences, you realize your strengths, you realize your weaknesses. You realize that God died for all, Jesus died for all of us. It don't matter. I teach karate class Tuesday night in White Oak. We've got mixed class. <clears throat> You know, my wife teaches a little exercise class. Everybody's welcome. It, you know, if you want us to come to your church and teach karate class, I'd be, I love to come. I love that we cry for Christ. Look us up online. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but please, volunteer at your local fire departments and your rescue squad. 
We need help. And if you volunteer, you still have to put in the hours. You still have to put in the time. You have to give to get. But what you get is you get a sense of community. I've lived here 17 years now. This is home. That's why I'm here. So I just want to say thank you for everybody coming out and help you volunteer fire department. Just this to the law enforcement home, what kind of classes or what kind of programs do y'all have to teach the, you know what I'm saying, the law enforcement like cultural and you know, some racial sensitivity, you know what I'm saying, amongst itself. Like when you, if you was to see a young black man and he's walking down the street, and this right here burns me up too, walking around, he got his pants dragging down to the ground, you know what I'm saying, what not do y'all, you know what I'm saying, automatically just have like the perception that the media throws out, you know what I'm saying, or do you go by your own feelings or whatnot? Do y'all have like, you know what I'm saying, something that prepares you for that? Uh, the North Carolina Highway Patrol, along with other law enforcement agencies, do criminal uh, training and standards out of Salemburg. Uh, and then we expound on ours a little bit. We have uh, juvenile and minority sensitivity training. We have gang awareness training. So that when we're in a neighborhood, it might be a gang that, you know, sometimes, even in this uniform, if I give you respect, you must as likely try to give me a hard time, especially when I just happen to be cruising through your neighborhood. That has been proven though to be a two-way door though. Some of y'all come to work with a bad attitude and you're being quite disrespectful as soon as you run up on somebody because you have this code that you say is suspect number one. Yes, sir. My, my, before, let me continue now. You know what I'm saying? I have respect for the law enforcement agent. My great uncle, Ron Martin, was the first black deputy sheriff in Blade County. My father, Grant Martin, served for the city and he worked over at the, uh, White Lake Prison Camp, and he also was a DMV, and he also was a probation and probation officer. You know what I mean? I was taught to give respect to law enforcement agents. You know what I'm saying? Because they are in my family. Bobby Martin, that's my cousin. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, you know what I mean? Y'all don't always give respect. And then you say you're giving these classes over at Salem I understand that. You know what I mean? But at any time, do you ever think that you might want to start a panel with youth? You know what I mean? And take the information from them, you know what I mean? So you can get their side of the story, so you might know how to approach them and interact them. I don't understand that your law is gospel in the land. I have no problem with that. But at the same time, though, it's also in the community that y'all like robots. You know what I mean? Y'all don't give second chances. You know what I mean? And we see and prove that every day through the media and other little things through just local. You know what I mean? So while you're giving these classes and things of that nature, you talk to these gang members, and you talk to these youth, you might want to start locally before you go to Salemburg, Sampson County and talk to them youth, you know what I mean? True indeed, you know what I'm saying, some of the same things are going on, you know what I mean, but not specifically detailed, exactly, you know what I mean? Well, this, this, this is what we're doing with this conversation. Let me jump in. Let's work together. Let's you and I get together and let's build on that. Wait, wait, wait. Build into that. Let's have this conversation. We're going to close out, and then let's have this conversation with you all. I'm going to stop the conversation. I don't want to stop the conversation. But it's past eight. And so I don't want to do it. Pastor, this is why I got this vast community here, here and a lot of good people from a lot of different churches and areas. And speak back to your point right quick. Give me two seconds. We were recruiting heavily right now. And I'll give it to you too, sir. Uh, we were recruiting heavily right now. 21 years old to 39 years old from North Carolina Highway Patrol. We, we started a new recruitment tool that you can come back to your home county if the position's available. So, if, and they're letting us, if we hire from Blake County, they can come back to Blake County. When I just come off a six and a half year tour in Robinson County, and over half of my officers over there were Native American from that community. So, if y'all know somebody, and, and send them to the local office, 21 to 39 years old. Thank you. Thank you all for being here tonight. Give yourselves a hand. We want to begin the discussion. We understand that accountability, education are our keys uh, to building a brighter future. We want to begin the discussion, but I want to challenge the pastors in here. I need a pastor to step up and take the next town hall. I need a pastor, you know, not right now, but uh, we're going to have our meeting first Tuesday of next month. 
uh, preferably by the time we have our meeting together, uh, that we will have another church that would have signed up to have the next town hall because, again, it's steps that we have to take. Thank you all. Let's bow for a word prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard. Now, God, I pray that you would empower us, oh God. Speak into our spirits, oh God, what it is that we need, oh God. Continue, oh God, to break down the barriers. God, continue, oh God, to destroy the hatred, oh God. And I pray, oh God, that you would bring us together as a community. That we might be the beacon in this nation, oh God. That we might be the beacon of light, oh God. That we might show, oh God, that we can stand together. I thank you for what you would do with us here in Bladen County. I thank you for what you're already doing. And I thank you for what you're about to do. Please be with us. Keep us safe as we travel. Shield us from hurt, woman, danger. And shield those we call hurt, woman, danger, too. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen.